Okay, everyone, thanks so much for joining. Uh, we're going to get started on the panel on special purpose credit programs and more. <laughs> My name is Maureen Yap, and I'm a senior counsel at the National Fair Housing Alliance. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to try something a little bit different here. We're going to have sort of a talk show format with a series of guests. Um, first, we'll have Frank from the CFPB, uh, followed by Pam Perry from Freddie Mac, and then uh, with Sarita Battles from Chase and Ken Scott from the Roman Law Firm. Um, and Ken and Sarita will be able to take questions from the audience. So I'm going to get started with Frank here and um, get started with his bio. So uh, Frank Vespa Papaleo from the CFPB will talk to us about special purpose credit programs. And uh, he is the Principal Deputy Director in the Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity at the CFPB. And prior to joining the CFPB, among other things, Frank served as Chief of Enforcement in HUD's Office of Housing and Equal Opportunity and also in private practice. So welcome, Frank. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maureen. So we'll get started by um, just starting with the basics. So if you could tell folks what a Special Purpose Credit Program, or SPCP, is, please. I'm happy to do that. Uh, first of all, thank you for having uh, me and everyone else here today. This is a wonderful opportunity. I do want to, uh, as a government official, issue my disclaimer uh, <laughs> that this presentation, and I do have to say this honestly, <laughs> is being made by a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative on behalf of the Bureau, and it does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the Bureau. <laughs> Everybody have that? Want me to repeat it? Or are you good? <laughs> okay. Uh, so what are SPCPs? Uh, special Purpose Credit Programs, or SPCPs, are a very promising voluntary opportunity uh, for lenders to address wealth inequality and other disparities. Um, far too many minority households and businesses continue to lack fair and equitable access to credit. And uh, this unmet need, is coupled with historical and ongoing discrimination, such as redlining, um, have exacerbated racial wealth divide and continue to leave many communities behind. One of the tools that can be used to improve things is the Special Purpose Credit Program. It's a provision of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which you may be familiar with, or ECOA, which is the civil rights law that, um, the federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of a number of characteristics. Um, but the um, ECOA has a provision in it that allows targeting um, lenders, uh, lenders being able to target and better serve black and Hispanic and other minorities who have been historically left out of, 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 um, of lending. So um, it is a program that exists, um, has actually existed now, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act actually just celebrated its 48th birthday last Friday, believe it or not. And it's been part of the ECOA for all that time. And the Regulation B, which, uh, which is used to implement ECOA, has significant um, information about what is a special purpose credit program, how to engage in it, what is needed to meet the obligations under the program, et cetera. Uh, what's important is that Congress clarified in ECOA what's, what is discrimination. It also clarified what is not discrimination. And a special purpose credit program that's properly done is not discrimination by law. <clears throat> um, Reg B, as I mentioned, is the interpreting rule for ECOA. And it establishes three kinds of special purpose credit programs. The first is one that's established that uh, is authorized under a federal or state law. It's a government program. I'm not going to talk about that one today very much. The second type is an SPCP that, assists, uh, that provides assistance from nonprofit organizations. These programs must benefit the nonprofit's members or an economically disadvantaged group or class of persons. And then the third, which is what I'll talk about the most are special purpose credit programs that are offered by for-profit organizations. Programs that uh, lenders that are for-profit um, must meet special social needs 
And if the program meets certain, certain requirements and standards that are prescribed by the law, it's permissible. Um, and that's uh, essentially what the programs are, are doing. They're an opportunity to leverage um, opportunities in your communities and in those that um, have been historically underrepresented to, uh, to increase uh, lending opportunities in those communities. Thanks, Frank. That's very helpful. And I think it's really helpful, too, to start by understanding that this is something that's in a statute, that it's part of the law. Um, so it's not just kind of a, a program that an institution develops on its own. This is a statutory and regulatory provision. Um, so having said that, Frank, um, could you tell us a little bit more about the requirements under the regulation? Sure thing. Um, in, uh, in section 102.8 of the law, of the of regulation B, it outlines what the requirements are for institutions that want to participate in a special, or roll out a special purpose credit program. Um, as I said, for nonprofits, uh, for nonprofits like credit unions or some kind of CDFIs in many cases and other organizations, SPCPs can be established um, with um, less of requirements than for for-profit organizations. So for nonprofit organizations, they need only um, identify what the benefits are to either its members or to economically disadvantaged class of people that it, that it seeks to serve. For for-profit organizations, though, there are a number of requirements that the uh, for-profit company lender must, must follow. Um, one is it must include or develop a written plan. The written plan identifies um, uh, certain information that I'll go through. The second thing that it must do is identify the purpose of extending the credit to this particular class of people that are likely to be benefited by, um, by the favorable terms that you're rolling out in the special purpose credit program. Um, it's important that, uh, to note that requiring a special purpose credit program for the benefit of economically and disadvantaged persons or to meet special social needs is really the key, the key um, factor in, uh, in the program. And, and that obviously the program cannot be something predatory. So you know, it, it really is for a, a, a proper and appropriate purpose. And so uh, the regulation will go through a lot of detail uh, about what exactly goes into a, a written plan, for example, or what, how one devises and analyzes data to inform its development of a special purpose credit program. Yeah, thanks, Frank. And so, um, as Frank has mentioned, this is part of a regulation, and the regulation for talks about for for-profit institutions setting up a written plan. So um, at the National Fair Housing Alliance, that's really where we get most of the questions. Um, so Frank, could you talk to us a little bit more about the written plan um, and also uh, in particular about the data that can be used to support the written plan? Sure thing. So the written plan <coughs> is a requirement not for non-for-profit but for for-profit institutions that seek to roll out a special purpose credit program. The, uh, the written plan has to define the class of persons that the program is designed to benefit. Uh, that is, uh, who would otherwise be denied credit or receive it on less favorable terms but for this program rolling out. Uh, number two, it, it must explain who the class of persons are and that they have to share a common characteristic, whatever you choose that characteristic to be. So for example, um, a written plan could identify uh, a class of persons as minority residents of, of a low to moderate income census tract, or uh, residents of a majority black census tract, or operators of small farms in a rural county, or minority or women small business owners in a particular uh, uh, geography. Uh, consumers with limited English proficiency could be a a, a group that they could benefit from a special purpose credit program or those living in the tribal land, for example. Uh, the second thing besides the identifying the group that will be uh, her, uh, um, assisted by the program 
is uh, procedures and standards that you must set out in this written plan explaining how you will, um, how the organization will increase credit availability to that impacted group. Uh, and then finally, it should include a uh, description of the duration of the program um, and probably a, an assessment of how often the organization will reassess whether it's working effectively or not or whether they need to extend the program for a longer period of time. Uh, so it's not done in ad infinitum. It's done for a period of time to address that inequity. Uh, and then finally, uh, as to the research or the data to support and justify the special purpose credit program, this is a very important uh, requirement and factor. And that can be done in a number of ways. Um, many institutions uh, you utilize their own internal data on, on, on their lending practices and, and their experiences with their, their, their customer network. And um, you can also use data that's a governmental report, governmental data, publicly available data like Humda, for example, can be utilized to identify a gap that you may have in your lending and address uh, assets of a special purpose credit program to fill that, that gap in a certain way. So there are lots of ways to, to uh, analyze and to use data to support and justify the program, but you must go through a process of, of, of finding uh, support uh, using data for the program. Thanks, Frank. So just a quick recap, then we have the ACOA statute, and basically this is an exception that allows you to um, target a specific class of people. Then you have Regulation B, and there are certain requirements under Regulation B, and one of those requirements is the written plan. Um, but at this point, you might be thinking, I'm still not exactly sure what we mean here. So, um, Frank, could you tell us a little bit about the types of programs that the CFPB is seeing so far? Sure. Um, uh, a number of agencies uh, connect with special purpose credit programs. So the Bureau is just one of many agencies that might, uh, might come across special purpose credit programs. Um, some of the ones that we've seen, and I obviously will not speak or name any particular ones, uh, uh, here, but uh, uh, we've seen special purpose credit programs that offer um, relaxed underwriting guidelines that provide down payment assistance, um, sometimes even grants, um, that reduce interest rates, um, other favorable terms for a particular class that they're seeking to, to, to address inequities for. So those are the kinds of terms or conditions that some entities have been looking at and, and implementing. Some you've seen in the news probably over the, over the course of a number of years. Um, also in determining the program, um, we've seen that uh, uh, situations where uh, companies have uh, wanted to require that, uh, that the recipients of the benefit um, have uh, common characteristics. It may be race, it may be nationality, national origin, it may be sex or gender. Um, special purposes of credit program, I mean, here I know, I know this audience is largely focused on mortgages and, and the housing market, but special purpose credit programs can be used in a number of other contexts. It could be used for auto loans, it could be used for small business lending, so it applies in every kind of lending market. Um, and in every circumstance, these programs, the status of the program depends on, of course, compliance with the statute ECOA, compliance with the regulation, regulation B, and, uh, and as I said earlier, a written plan and justification through data and, and, and analysis. So there are lots of programs out there. Um, most entities don't um, sort of advertise that their program is a qualifies as a special purpose credit program, and that's, that's fine. Some do, so there's a real mix there as to sort of identifying, and there's no, there's no centralized list that exists of special purpose credit programs in this country, who does them, who doesn't, or when they're happening. Um, but those are generally what we're seeing. That's great, thanks Frank. And so uh, for folks who have follow-up questions uh, for their institution, can they interact with the CFPB and also, can they get approval from the CFPB? 
Yes, they can interact. No, they cannot get approval. Uh, special purpose credit programs are not designed to uh, receive approval or disapproval from any government agency. In fact, we're not permitted to approve it or, or, or disapprove of a program. We're happy to have conversations. We're happy, and depending on the context of the circumstance, uh, there are different vehicles to converse with us, for example. So if you are working with a lender that is uh, supervised by the CFPB, uh, the recommendation is that they contact their supervisory examination point of contact, and they will set up a call and, and give them an opportunity to talk about the program and share information. If it's uh, like a trade organization that wants to have a conversation more generally, they could contact our office directly uh, or uh, the, uh, um, the Office of uh, Financial Institutions at the Bureau. And finally, there is actually a mechanism at the Bureau which exists for every regulation, not just for Regulation B, which we call the regular, regulatory, uh, regu regulatory Inquiries Track. And that allows anyone, whether it's uh, an industry trade group, a lender, a consumer organization, a civil rights advocate, whomever, to inquire about how the Bureau interprets a regulation. And uh, if you want information in detail about how to access that service, just Google CFPB regulatory inquiries. It's the first thing that comes up. It gives you a, a very easy way of connecting with us. I will say that the guidance that they offer uh, is not official bureau um, you know, uh, authorized guidance in terms of it generally applies to everyone. It may apply to that particular fact pattern or circumstance, and obviously these things are very complicated. But that's a great mechanism to also, whether it's Reg B or any other regulation, to get some uh, understanding of how the Bureau has interpreted the regulations involved. Yeah, and, and speaking of the, the mechanisms and interpretation, um, that's very helpful. The, in uh, recent times, the agencies have done a great job of providing more guidance on this, trying to help lenders um, and others, including nonprofits, to actually make these types of loans. Um, so one of those was the interagency statement. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the interagency statement, uh, what's in there, and also why uh, the regulators and the DOJ came together to put that statement out? Sure thing, yes. In uh, February of, of 2022, uh, eight agencies, including the Bureau, uh, and as Maureen mentioned, um, the DOJ, uh, FDIC, the Federal Reserve Board, the OCC, FHFA, NCUA, I think I have everybody, uh, came together and issued a joint interagency statement. Um, it's, it was just historic. It's the very first time they've ever done this interagency, articulating the importance of considering special purpose credit pro programs as a vehicle to address inequity in, in lending markets. Um, and um, it also, in there, references a number of other guidances issued by various agencies, in, including one issued in December of 2021 by HUD. HUD issued, gui issued <coughs> guidance at that time that made clear that, um, uh, in, in the mortgage context, that um, a properly prepared and justified special purpose credit program under ECOA and Reg B would not violate the, Federal, the Fair Housing Act, which was a very important statement for them to make. The interagency statement um, references that guidance as well as some guidance that the CFPB has issued um, prior, previously about special purpose credit programs applicability to for-profit institutions. Uh, much of the detail that I talked about earlier is in that advisory opinion. I've actually um, left for the organizers of this event um, a one-page cheat sheet of resources that can be uh, uh, shared uh, later on that has links to all of the guidance materials and the interagency statement is in there, a, ref a, a link to the regulation B, a link to the statute itself, and a link to several other communications like blog posts that share more detail about the program. Well, that's perfect. And of course, then I'll take this opportunity to make a shameless plug for the National Fair Housing Alliance website with the, with the uh, Special Purpose Credit Program Toolkit. It was done jointly with the Mortgage Bankers Association. It also has all of the um, uh, 
uh, regulatory guidance that's available, and it also has uh, links to other groups that you might be interested in contacting to partner with them to offer these types of programs. So thank you so much, Frank. We really appreciate it. And so let's say round of applause for Frank. Thank you so thank much. You, Marie, thanks, everybody. Okay. You are free. And uh, now we will welcome Pam Perry. Oh, look at her, so athletic. <laughs> and Pam Perry is the Vice President for Single Family Equitable Housing at Freddie Mac. Prior to joining Freddie Mac, among other things, Pam served as Deputy Atten Attorney General overseeing a council on large scale community development projects such as the development of the Nationals Park and the DC Wharf. I didn't know that about you, Pam, so I thought that was so cool. <laughs> so thanks for doing that. Um, and I started with your title, and so Pam, I was hoping you could start with explaining a little bit about the department where you're at at uh, Freddie Mac and your role there. Great, thank you, Maureen, and uh, happy to be here um, with all of you this afternoon. Um, I lead um, equitable housing for Freddie Mac's single family division. I know some folks in the room today are single family focused and some are multifamily focused. Um, I do have a counterpart in our multifamily business. Um, we work very closely together um, in advancing um, our um, enterprises, equitable housing commitments. Um, as uh, many of you know, we published an equitable housing finance plan um, in June of this year. It is the product of a lot of work, including a lot of conversations with many of you during the course of the development of that plan. Um, and in the single family space, which I lead, um, the challenge was um, what can we do differently in the housing finance system to close the racial and ethnic homeownership and wealth gaps? And obviously that's a big question that um, is um, steeped in historical um, discrimination and institutional um, bias. And uh, the solutions to it are, um, are many and complex, and they are not solutions that Freddie Mac alone um, can implement to um, eradicate the current um, inequities in the housing um, finance system. So um, we appreciate our partnership with the industry. Um, everything that I am doing every day is um, something that Freddie Mac can only be successful doing in partnership with other stakeholders in the mortgage industry. Um, and I guess I would say, you know, historically Freddie Mac has, um, you know, our, our purpose, our mission is to provide um, affordability, liquidity, and stability to the mortgage market. Um, and we've done that, you know, kind of through the cycle um, in, in, in all economic cycles. And we've historically focused on addressing the needs of underserved communities, defining underserved as low and moderate income families. So our affordable housing goals, akin to many of your CRA requirements, um, have focused over a long period of time on assisting um, low and moderate income families and achieving home ownership. But when we look at the racial disparities in um, home ownership, obviously what we were doing to address low and moderate income home ownership was not um, benefiting um, families of color equitably. And so um, there was a need to really dig deep and do something different. And that is, in fact, um, the charge of my team. And we have kind of unofficially put as part of our mission, it's not just affordability, stability, and liquidity. It is um, equity as well. And so I have the privilege of leading that team and um, trying to really move the needle on these issues that are um, pretty wicked and entrenched and um, um, happy to have the charge, would be happier still if, if all of us um, didn't need to have this conversation, but um, happy to, to do this work and talk a little bit more about it today. Yeah, 
Thank you, Pam. And so as Pam mentioned, there's the equitable housing finance plans, which uh, Fannie and Freddie's regulator, the FHFA, required for the first time this year, which was really exciting because it was a chance, um, as Pam mentioned, to look at these uh, intractable, very difficult issues and kind of put uh, a plan together. Um, so Pam, could you tell us a little bit more about that and uh, maybe a status update on some of the um, action plans? Sure, and I do promise to come back to special purpose credit <laughs> programs as, as, as part of what we discussed today. Um, but the reality is there's a, there's a lot um, in our equitable housing finance plan, um, including, but not limited to special purpose credit programs. There are a lot of, kind of inefficiencies in the mortgage system and wherever there are inefficiencies, it creates um, expense and barriers and makes it that much harder for um, first time home buyers to achieve a mortgage. Um, there are a lot of systemic barriers in the economy right now, but notwithstanding that, we're still um, successful at, um, in, for example, in the second quarter of this year and in putting a lot of um, first time home buyer families into home ownership. But among some of the things that we're doing in the plan that are um, out and that we have some success and some track record on already is um, in the multifamily space, we incentivized um, multifamily um, owner operators to report on time rent payment to credit repositories. And we all know that rental payments or a housing payment is um, the single largest expense that families have, including families who rent. And for the vast majority of families who rent, their on-time rental payment <coughs> histories are not reflected in their credit history. As a result of us um, incentivizing owners and operators of properties we finance um, to report these payments, um, roughly 100,000 renters, renters in these buildings have to opt in to having their rental payment data reported. Um, 100,000 renters have enrolled in the program um, in the first year. 20% of those renters um, have achieved credit scores for the first time as a result of having their rental um, payment history reported. And of those with credit scores, initially, more than two-thirds of them have improved their score by at least 40 points. So that is um, not insignificant in terms of bringing folks up to being mortgage ready, um, bringing folks out of the shadows of um, the mainstream financial system and making them um, you know, truly credit visible and mortgage ready. So we're really encouraged by the momentum um, in rent reporting and are, and are hoping that it will be you know, catalytic in terms of um, getting more positive rental payment data um, into the credit repositories. But since that is a slow process, um, we've looked directly um, and have improved our automated underwriting system so that um, we can detect rental payments um, from bank statement data. And so we have rolled out um, a functionality in Loan Product Advisor, which is our automated underwriting system, that permits us to underwrite borrowers um, who don't have rental payment data or don't have credit scores, um, if they provide access to their bank data, we can mine that bank data because we are looking for the largest recurring payment in that bank statement. Um, and we can detect what that rental payment data is and then give that prospective borrower credit in the underwriting process um, for having that on-time rent payment. In addition to that, we have rolled out, um, this week we are officially rolling out the capability for, um, the capability for borrowers who their loans receive a caution in our automated underwriting system. There is a feedback message that will go back to the lender who submitted that loan to us to say if this borrower provides us access to their bank statement data, we will underwrite their cash flow to see, so not just rental payment data, but underwriting the borrower's cash flow um, to give that borrower credit from having a, po a positive cash flow over time. 
um, even though that positive cash flow may not be fully um, reflected in the tri-merge credit report that we received from the bureaus. And so we're pretty excited about that. Um, each of these opportunities together to um, permit us to underwrite um, more borrowers, more borrowers of color who tend to be disproportionately represented both in terms of in the population of loans that get denied as well as the borrowers disproportionately represented in the borrowers who benefit um, from us rolling out this functionality. So we're pretty excited about both of those. Um, some other things that I wanted to touch upon that we are um, pretty excited about. Um, one of the challenges on my plate in my portfolio over which I feel like I have the, the least control is housing supply. Um, obviously, we know how much supply and now interest rates um, affect the ability of families to um, get into first-time home ownership. Um, one of the things that we've done that was within our control is we've really, we've changed our underwriting guidelines as it relates to accessory dwelling units. Um, you know, with uh, limited housing stock and limited land on which you can build single family housing and the expense of building single family housing, um, ADUs in particular in densely populated areas um, provide some relief in terms of creating additional housing stock. And so we have um, expanded our credit requirements um, at the request of the industry um, to make it easier to um, finance the construction of an accessory dwelling unit as well as um, for borrowers to qualify for a mortgage um, using the the anticipated rental income on an accessory dwelling unit. Um, a lot of folks have accessory dwelling units, in-law suites, whatever. It may be a relative living there, but not <laughs> in all cases. It could, in fact, be a third party living there paying you rent, which should be reflected in your income when you're looking to underwrite um, the mortgage on the, on the entire property. Um, another thing that we've rolled out that is kind of the beginning of something yet to come is we made a commitment about a year ago that we would issue um, $3 billion in affordable housing bonds. And what we did is we securitized loans, well, we securitized all the loans that we take in, but we securitized loans that were um, uh, affordable housing loans. So our affordable um, housing LMI borrower products, we securitized them exclusively into bonds that we labeled as affordable housing bonds as a precursor on our journey to enter the social bond market. We all know that there is tremendous um, investor appetite for ESG um, asset classes and um, the Fannie and Freddie, the GSEs, are potentially one of the largest suppliers of um, social impact paper, um, but we don't brand it, label it as it doesn't carry that social bond flag on Bloomberg. And so we are on a journey um, to become social bond issuers. And so um, our commitment of issuing affordable bonds, which once we get to the point of um, becoming social bond issuers, that paper will be rebranded as social bonds. So it will be relabeled as social bonds so that it can trade and be um, repooled with social bonds that we issue um, in the future. And so um, we've partnered with a lot of folks on Wall Street. One of the things that we think is really kind of exciting is there's a tremendous appetite for um, social bond paper and, and, and a need for more of it, um, particularly among um, international investors who are clamoring for um, ESG bonds. So if there's an, an ability to secure a premium in the marketplace on that paper, it provides um, additional liquidity to finance, um, to finance the creation of uh, more loans to low and moderate income um, families and minority families 
um, that uh, it, it, it's a nice feedback loop if investors are willing to pay more. It's more money that we all have to invest in um, first-time home ownership to these communities of borrowers. And so um, that's another thing kind of like on our trajectory. Um, something else that we've invested a lot of time in that has touched a lot of folks in the industry is we've really dug into our appraisal data. There's been a lot of kind of chatter in you know, even in kind of in mainstream media about um, appraisal um, gaps uh, faced by borrowers of color and folks in communities of color. And we have um, used our appraisal data uh, to kind of validate the anecdotes that all of us have, um, have seen in the media. We haven't been able to validate that there are gaps or that there were bias with respect to all of those anecdotes you've read about, but we have been able to validate that there are gaps along racial and ethnic lines. And um, we're partnering with the industry to address um, the disparities that we've, um, that we've validated. And that is um, partnering with the Appraisal um, Institute and the uh, appraiser, Appraisal Diversity Initiative that um, involves the appraisal industry, as well as Fannie Mae, um, trying to diversify the complexion of appraisers themselves. It's a very white male dominated aging field um, in which there are very few people of color, um, does not reflect the communities that are being served by that industry. So in addition to developing um, what we hope is greater use of technology, to address some of the, the gaps that we're seeing. We're also looking to diversify um, the folks in the industry who are on the ground um, doing appraisal work. And since we started doing that work, there are more than 400 new entrants to um, becoming appraisers this year. And it is um, a, a wildly diverse group of folks. And we're really excited about, about supporting those individuals on their journey to become um, appraisers, including providing them grants and providing them um, mentors so that they actually can can become full-fledged appraisers. So I think I'll stop there. There's a, a laundry list of a bunch of I'm, stuff that we're, yep. that we're working on that we're pretty excited about. And um, for anybody who looks at the equitable housing finance plan, there are dozens of tactics that we have identified that we're um, using to address the disparities in the marketplace. And all but one of them we're actively engaged in. It was a three-year plan. So it's year one, rounding out the end of year one. We're going to continue to refresh it on an annual basis. Um, but there's a lot of work that's in flight in a lot of different areas that we're just not ready to talk about yet because we really want to talk about success, not just plans, but what do we have that we can show for the, the time and um, taxpayer dollars that we are um, spending to advance this work and hopefully make a, a, a fair housing finance system. Thanks, Pam. Yeah. That's great. It's great to hear all these initiatives. And I think um, the panel before talked about that it's just so much easier to have these conversations um, and see all the initiatives that can be rolled out. So uh, I think <coughs> folks are on the edge of their seats now, so they want to know. <laughs> Special purpose credit program. Uh, what does yeah. Freddie Mac have in the work or on the journey? Yeah, so I, I wish I could say more today than <laughs> I can, but um, the, the timing of this conference is such that um, I almost wish it were a couple weeks in the future, but um, we are where we are today. We've been um, hard at work on um, special purpose credit programs, as have many of you. Um, one of the things that um, our CEO announced at the MBA conference last week is that we are looking to um, roll out an expedited process of reviewing lenders' proprietary SPCP, P, SPCP um, programs. Um, I've probably 
talked to a couple dozen lenders about their either SPCPs they have in the marketplace already or are hoping to bring to market and you know for which they are looking for liquidity in the secondary market. And so um, up until this point in time, um, we haven't provided much in terms of concrete um, approvals or answers to the primary market other than to say, if you have an SPCP and it complies with our seller servicer guide today, we'll buy those loans all day long. You don't need our approval. Um, to the extent that you are doing things that are outside of what is permissible under our guide today, um, we are kind of collecting all of these and kind of putting them all into the sausage making process of um, what do we need to change? What do we need to put into our own SPCP so that we can provide liquidity to your programs? What do we need to do in terms of granting you waivers to our guide so that we, you know that we will purchase loans um, pursuant to the SPCPs that you are standing up in the marketplace. Um, we are working with a number of lenders as it relates to our first SPCP, what we're calling phase one of our SPCP that we are um, hoping to implement by the end of this year. So we are in conversations with a number of lenders um, who are our clients to um, secure their commitments to underwrite mortgages um, under our um, Freddie Mac SPCP. Um, while simultaneously I am working on a, our phase two SPCP, which um, we expect to be even bigger and broader and more impactful than what we're going out with in phase one. So, um, you know, I think there is some sentiment in the market that folks in the primary market um, have been trying to get our attention on SPCPs for a year. I guess I've been in this role for two years, but probably for a year, a number of our clients, um, some of whom I know are in the room, have been having conversations and probably have felt a little bit of frustration, like, when it, you know, just get there already. And um, we're really trying to get there in a very thoughtful way. Um, the downturn in the market and the, you know, really um, kind of thorny financial picture right now um, gives us pause. We've been very, very careful in terms of how we think about um, going into um, expanding access to credit for minority families in a down market. That is, in fact, part of what has made this a bit slower than even I might have liked at times. And that is um, when we run projections on what um, expected defaults are under some of the expansions that we have been considering and what stressed defaults look like, sometimes they are uncomfortably high. And the last thing that I want to do is put um, black and Latino and other minority families into first time home ownership only to have a, a really significant number of them um, be unable to retain those homes in a down market. And we are in a down, in a declining market. And so um, that is, as a matter of our safety and soundness, we have to be concerned about that. But really, frankly, as a matter of equity, we have to be concerned about that. And um, if on my dime we put folks into homes and a third of them lose those homes in the span of the next five years, um, you know, kind of shame on all of us. But there is, in fact, um, a way to do this responsibly that allows a lot more um, borrowers of color, middle income borrowers of color who have been um, denied access to um, home ownership to achieve it um, in a way that is responsible, that they can retain through the cycle. And that is kind of, that's what gets me up out of bed doing this work every day to really drive impact in that way. And while you haven't seen much yet, buckle more up, come. more <laughs> to come. A lot more to come. Thank you so much, Pam. Round of applause for Pam. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks for having me. And now, Sarita and Ken. And you know what? I'll move over, give them a little more space. Um, OK. And I will read up the. 
You guys want to? Oh, yes, no problem. <laughs> okay, so Sarita Battles is the Managing Director, Head of Community and Affordable Lending at J.P. Morgan Chase. She has 33 years of experience. She started when he was, she was 10 years old <laughs> in the financial industry with 25 years specifically dedicated to mortgages. So thank you, Sarita. Thank you. And welcome to Ken Scott, who is counsel at Relman Colfax, focused on counseling financial institutions on best practices for complying with fair lending and consumer protection laws and navigating financial technology issues. Um, so thank you, Ken, and welcome. So Sarita, I think we're gonna start with you because I think at this point folks wanna kind of get a deeper dive on special purpose credit programs. So could you tell us a bit more about Chase's program? Yes, so, um, First of all, it's just exciting to be here and to be able to talk about this, but um, we rolled out our program in January of 2021. Um, we were one of probably the first big lenders to um, be thinking about SPCP and what we could potentially do in that particular space. And so we started thinking about it and working on it in 2020. Um, and I will tell you, I, I think um, Frank got up and talked about the written plan. Um, we did a uh, a fantastic job working very closely with our legal and compliance teams, um, our corporate responsibility teams, just to really understand what is it that we were trying to do. And then to just also be able to pull the data points that would really drive um, our ability to participate in the program. And so we do have a uh, written plan that really spells out the why behind it. Um, we leveraged Humda data. Um, to pull some of the um, data insights that would really indicate um, that a segment of folks were underserved. Um, and so leveraging like the home ownership rates and understanding that, understanding like LTVs um, in comparison to debt to income ratios. Um, we even looked at our own book of business um, just to kind of understand like what are some of the things that we were seeing. And pretty quickly we were able to identify um, in, in this order um, that Blacks um, were underserved um, in this particular space, um, fast follow Hispanic Latino segments. Um, and so we took a look at that um, as far as a segment. And then we also looked at geographies. Um, and we looked at the lending in minority tracks or Hispanic tracks, black tracks, um, just to see uh, whether or not there was disparity. And there was. Um, and so we leveraged those insights, put those things in our written plan. Um, and then we also started to do some other due diligence, looking at some of the articles, some of the things that were written, understanding some of the barriers to home ownership, because we do have a policy center that really kind of digs in and understands those things. Um, and we realized like two of the biggest barriers, um, especially when you're talking about closing the racial wealth gap, um, two of the biggest barriers to home ownership for blacks and Hispanics were really in the space of down payment assistance and closing cost. Um, or source of funds to close. Um, and so in those spaces, we do work with a lot of state um, and local housing um, finance agencies with their particular programs, but you have so many of them and there are so many different parameters um, that for big lenders and others to be able to carry the torch on some of those programs, it's a little bit difficult, but we still participate in those, but we thought it would be good for us to be able to create a grant. And that's what we did. We created a $5,000 grant um, and it was not based on customer qualification. We did it based on geography. And we wanted to make sure that in minority communities, particularly black census tracts and Hispanic census tracts, um, that those properties, that if people purchased properties in those neighborhoods, that it would number one, stabilize those neighborhoods, but then give people an opportunity um, to be able to access home ownership with down payment assistance and or closing costs. So the customer has the option um, to be able to leverage it for down payment and or um, closing costs. And so that's how we rolled out our particular program, um, focused on geography. And I think one of the other key points, and I don't know whether or not it's been made very clearly, is that in that written plan and based on the ACOA guidelines, you have to be able to track that the beneficiaries of your special, pro um, special purpose program that they receive it. And so you know, the best way to do that for us was leveraging geography. Um, simply because um, it doesn't require the loan officer to be out there to talk about it and qualify the customer on it. 
um, or to look at the customer and try to determine, especially with a lot of things being done digitally today, um, we were able to do it and put, put it on the property. So the property qualifies for the grant. The value proposition and all of that is that there's a value proposition for the customer, there's a value proposition for the realtor, the builder, and the nonprofits that are in these communities of color. And so with that said, that's the way we set out to um, leverage the program. That's part of our written um, program today. Uh, we've seen a lot of success with it, um, but I will say this, the success of the program is not the program itself. The success of the program is based on your infrastructure. So you need to make sure that you have the right people with the right presence as long and with the right partners in, that, in those communities. So making sure you have loan officers that are present in the communities that they're seeking to serve, as well as the partners that have the trust and consideration in the communities that we're looking to um, operate in. And so when we have those things together, that level of infrastructure, coupled with the SPCP program and the array of products and programs that we have, that's when we see significant business. When we lack anything in that infrastructure, that's when we have to go back, look at our SPCP program and say, is the SPCP program not working or is it because we have or lack something in our coverage model or something in our infrastructure? And so obviously from a national perspective, we've done very well um, with this program, but then when you start to go into local markets to see how the program is being utilized, you have to look at your coverage model to make sure that you have the right level of support to make sure that you can execute against your SPCP. Thank you so much, You're Rita, welcome. and thanks to you and to Chase for leadership in this space. It's been just so helpful um, for Chase to t be one of the first to take the first step. So. Yes, and, and not only just um, in that particular space, but then encouraging others. Um, so I, I have uh, people that are in the same role that I'm in in other institutions, and I am, you know, Chase is very forthcoming in, uh, in speaking about the opportunity that's in this space, how they might be able to look at doing it, um, and then just basically just taking the leap. Mm -hmm. um, because I think a lot of people just won't take the leap. And I think sometimes you just gotta put a little bit of faith in that leap, make sure you have the right infrastructure and the written plan, and then just take everybody along the way for the journey. Because a lot of the work that we had to do was internal, just to convince our folks that this was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And once you got them on board, then they could carry it forward. Um, and then we're still convincing to this day, both internal, internally and externally, we're still convincing people that this is the right thing to do and to stay the course as long as you got the right infrastructure in place to be able to execute against it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarita. And I'm going to turn to uh, Ken in a minute, but just wanted to let you know that um, right after uh, Ken speaks, then it'll be time for questions. So those of you who have questions can raise your hand, and the folks with the mics will come see you. Um, so Ken, I will uh, turn to you. And Sarita described Chase's plan, um, but as Frank mentioned, there's all kinds of plans out mm -hmm. there. Um, so could you talk to us a little bit about uh, what you and your firm are seeing, uh, especially or including uh, any nonprofit plans. Yeah. <clears throat> so good afternoon, everyone. So we're seeing a number of things out there. And if you look at Reg B and the special purpose credit program provisions, you know, it has a provision for for-profit institutions. It has a provision and requirements, well, less so for nonprofit institutions. And there's even something for CDFIs. And I think we're seeing things across all of those constituencies. And I'll stick, start out with for-profits. Primarily where we see it is similar to what Sarita just described. Mortgage, people that are offering mortgages are looking to offer an SBCP. Um, primarily, I'm seeing most of them in geographic, although that raises some concerns. And I know NAFA has some challenges with geographic base because it kind of, although it's great for that community, it traps, the argument is it may trap people in those communities and not give them mobility. So. You know, we're looking at different permutations as to how you would do geography to address some of those concerns. We see a few borrower-based SBCPs, not as many as we would like to see probably. Then we see in the small business space, women-owned and minority-owned businesses, a number of people coming out with those. Um, on the nonprofit side, nonprofits are coming out with their own SBCPs, Primarily grant focused, they're getting, and they're trying to work with for-profit institutions 
And that in itself presents some challenges, and I know maybe some of you have some questions around that. And we can do, dive a little deeper there. Um, and then on the CDFI side, what we're seeing is folks are looking to kind of fill gaps, particularly on the small business space, figuring out how they can provide liquidity to small businesses in majority minority areas, majority black owned, majority women owned businesses, and doing it in a way that you know, gets them access to capital a little more quickly and a little easier. Thanks, Ken. Okay. okay, folks, you have two of the national experts on SPCPs, and this is a very complex area. So um, any questions so far? Um, uh, do we have mics around? Oh, okay, the gentleman here has a question. And sorry, it would have been easier to start with the gentleman back there. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just have a quick question for uh, Sarita. I'm just curious. How often are you reviewing your program to maybe select geographies in different markets? So um, my team is responsible for looking at and monitoring on a weekly basis. So we're looking at this weekly um, just to make sure that the program is doing what it was intended to do. Um, I would say that um, even in doing it on a weekly basis, um, the things that we're starting to see more of and, and we hear a lot about is just, again, going back to the local market. Nationally, it looks really good. And, and I'll tell you what we tend to do is we look um, from a standpoint of at least 50% or more of the customers that are receiving the SPCP, uh, whether they're black or Hispanic. So that's what I'm looking for from a national perspective. When we go down into the local markets, you begin to see like a, a market for us, like a Chicago market is about 70% accretive to blacks and Hispanics. Um, but when I look at Chicago specifically, we got a well oil engine there. We got the right salespeople, we're in the right market, so on and so forth. But then I might go to another market and I might see 30% accretiveness. And so then I have to take a, a you know, peel back the onion to understand this 30% accretiveness, what, what's going on in that, this particular market. Um, so do I have the right coverage model or loan officers that are in that particular market? Are they, go are they going into these minority tracks and doing business in that marketplace? And then I'm having a discussion with our sales organization about strategy, execution at the local level. So before we look to exit out of a program or exit out of a market, we're tending to look to make sure that are we doing the right things in the market before we exit? Because we don't want to um, impact the customer negatively just because we can't execute against it. So that's having a harder conversation with our sales people around um, just accountability. And so from that perspective, we do pretty good. I will say that when we rolled out our program um, in 2021, we rolled nationally to black tracks. So that's 6,700 black tracks that we rolled out nationally to. Um, we recently, because we're always looking to enhance our program, um, and we focused on black census tracks initially, understanding that we were getting black and Hispanic business because again, you know, not all, it's not a one-to-one. -one, and so when you go into specific tracks, you're gonna see other folks there. Um, but what we did um, in July of this year, we, instead of going national, we decided to be very intentional and go out to 20 um, Hispanic MSAs um, covering about 3,700 census, uh, Hispanic census tracts. And these were MSAs where Hispanics are purchasing homes. And so again, just going out into those particular Hispanic tracts um, to identify that. And so now we're probably in about 10,000 census tracts today. And so we have to monitor this on a weekly basis. So I have a team of folks um, that monitor, that provide feedback, and then we bring that visibility up to our leadership team so that we can make some sound decisions about how we move forward. If we need to exit out, how do we go about doing that, so on and so forth. That's great, Sreed. Thank you. You're um, I think there was a gentleman in the back. Yep. Clark Ziegler with the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. We were looking at using federal ARPA funds to address the racial homeownership gap with a um, down payment and closing cost assistance program with an explicit racial preference. And we hit a brick wall with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and I guess the, the question is, um, you know, basically any, any entity that, that handles federal funds is subject to a standard that in some ways is in conflict with the, you know, equal credit opportunity provision. So is there sort of a double standard here where the banks and the private institutions have more running room since CDFIs and a number of other nonprofits receive federal funds. 
Um, is there sort of a double track here? Of those, conf those statutes seem to be in, co in conflict with each other. Well, um, I'll take that one. I think I can tell you there are CDFIs that are leveraging the SBCP provisions of the ECOA, but as you know, as you're thinking through kind of the Section 1983 and all the other issues that you raised. If you design, follow the ECOA requirements very carefully, and although it doesn't require you to have a written plan, if you look at those written plan requirements, it follows much of what's required if you're going to kind of have an affir reaching out from an affirmative perspective on many of those statutes. And if you think about harmonizing kind of how, all, how it all works together, there is some, I think folks are taking the risk and walking that line. Would I say it's 100% perfect? I would be remiss if I said that, but I, I will tell you people are walking that line. Okay? Thanks, Kay. Uh, we have one question here. Uh, hi, uh, Jung Choi from the Urban Institute. Um, I just had a question to Sarada. Um, I think it's related to Pam's point too about how the market is really changing rapidly. So your program started from last year. So have you seen some changes in um, implementing SPCP or like the changes in the composition of your customers because of the changing market situation over the past few years? Yeah, so one of the things that just obviously recently happened is the implementation of the 2020 census. And so did that change a, a few of the markets? It did, but it wasn't anything significant or impactful where we thought, um, you know, we, you know, we would be missing a, a large group of people. What I will tell you is like when I'm out and about and I'm talking about the program and something that we are looking at is today we provide this SPCP in those minority tracks, those black or Hispanic census tracks. So it's the property that qualifies. And so one of the things that we're looking at now is looking at the opportunity to look at current address. So if you currently live in a minority or black or Hispanic census tract, and you want to move to another area that's more of a majority um, census tract, that grant will follow you there. So that's the one thing that we're looking at from an enhancement standpoint, um, because again, I think we're trying to solve for or answer the question around um, folks feeling as though we're um, kind of hell bounding them to stay in that one track or in that specific track versus them being able to move out um, to a majority track, maybe where there might be better schools or whatever the case may be. And so that's another uh, enhancement that I do believe eventually will come with us. Um, but what we're trying to do is get more out of the program that we're offering now. Um, just a little bit more um, utilization of the program by our loan officers going into those communities because we do know that this does help to stabilize these communities. So I think that's the one big thing uh, that we're looking at. Um, there are some programs out there now where people are looking at um, leveraging their balance sheet. Um, and so it's more in the um, underwriting space, um, offering a different type of programming that is balance sheet um, focused. Um, I can tell you we're talking about that because Bank of America rolled out a program and I believe it was in six cities and it just blew up in JP Morgan Chase. Like what, what can we, can we do something like that? Those types of things. So obviously as other lenders are participating and doing their programs, we're also looking at the, that programming to be able to make some decisions around whether or not we might do something different. Um, so we do reserve the right to enhance our written plan um, to add some additional things on there. Um, one example of that is we leverage correspondent lending. We don't just do it in our field sales in centralized sales areas. Um, we do work with some of our non-delegated correspondent lenders that give us the ability to um, underwrite those loans and close in our names. And what we do is we provide them with an incentive. Um, so that incentive is some, somewhere in the neighborhood of up to $5,000. And so we will incent them, we provide them incentives on the underwriting, so how we underwrite and the cost and those types of things. And we've been seeing some really good results, even with our correspondent lenders, because those lenders are already in those markets and serving those consumers. So as we're building as an organization with people and presence and partners, our correspondent lenders are already out there doing it. And so why not offer them the opportunity to be able to advance home ownership among blacks and Hispanics by providing them with this type of program. So again, it's always this, um, like I said, you gotta take the leap first um, and get involved and engage 
but then as you're doing that, leveraging the research and the insights and the monitoring that you're doing to enhance your program along the way. With Correspondent, we started in about maybe 13 or 15 markets. Um, here, I believe it was this month, we rolled out nationally for our Correspondent Lending Program. And so again, um, just you know, sticking and moving and trying to see what works best. Um, but I do believe that SPCP is going to have to be a little bit multifaceted. Um, in order to be able to reach the communities and the segments that we're seeking to serve. And I think it's going to also require more lenders getting involved in this space um, so that we can reach more people. Thanks, Serena. Any other questions? One, just a, yeah. we'll take another, just one piggybacking on this. Yeah, just definitely. some thoughts here as we think through this. I think Pam raised a very interesting concern as to kind of Freddie Mac trending as we're move, moving forward on their SBCP. And I think as we think about kind of the legal landscape and where we are, we want SBCPs to be around for time immemorial. And as we're going through this, and I think Chase is, is doing this, is we need to be very thoughtful that the programs we come out, we're providing responsible mm -hmm. lending to people that's sustainable and that they can keep in. Because the last thing that we want as we're rolling out these programs is to have it where somebody can demonstrate that perhaps we're moving into predatory type lending and doing it under the guise of an SBCP. Mm -hmm. So I think many of us can think back to and lived kind of the subprime industry. We need to make sure that the SBCP programs that we're putting in place, nobody <coughs> takes us down that road because we really want to do this in a way where we serve the communities mm -hmm. in a responsible way and develop the communities and never have a problem where we look back five, 10 years and we're not proud of what we've done. Absolutely. That's great. Thank okay. you, Ken. Question here. Yeah. I'm Mark Willis, NYU Furman Center. Uh, as an academic, uh, I'm really interested in, and I'm very impressed by your ongoing monitoring and measuring of outcomes. Could you talk a little bit more about all the kinds of measures that you use to try and understand better what's working and what's not working? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, one of the things, and usually our report on a weekly basis is about three to five pages. Um, so we're looking at a lot, lot of different um, things. Number one, just usage of the program. Um, you know. It's been very clear, like I told you, internally it's, it's a big deal. You know, just making sure that your folks feel comfortable um, and understand the program enough to know how to position it out in the community. So that's number one. Number two, uh, we also have some programming that also tells us grant eligible properties um, that are available in the marketplace. So like today, I just looked at it and I think it was in, you know, as of the end of September, we had 117 grant eligible properties or listings that were out there um, covering various different markets. So giving our salespeople tools and resources to be able to go after the business. So we do monitor what that looks like. We monitor our, you know, applications and fundings. You know, how many applications are we getting in for the program versus how many fund? Uh, because again, we're leveraging all of our products and programs with the exception of Jumbo. So it has to be a conforming purchase. Um, and so we look at, you know, the, pro the product usage. Um, what programs is it going into? Um, we have some of our risk folks that are um, looking at, you know, SPCP, what's the performance on the back end of SPCP loans, which I kind of challenge that a little bit because the SPCP is a grant and they're leveraging the products and programs that we have already, whether it's agency, whether it's government, um, those types of things. So the product kind of in the credit parameters within the product might dictate, you know, like some of the, um, the performance on the back end of those. Um, we look at the mix, obviously, um, to make sure like what percentage of it is going to blacks, what percentage of it is going to Hispanics, um, making sure that we can understand that and where are we seeing that growth happen. Um, so we do get testimonials from our sales organization that tells us what are your best practices, how are you going out there with the program, what are you seeing, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I look at it market by market so that I could um, you know, either stack rank, see who's doing it, why they're doing it this way, so on and so forth, and then what markets aren't even performing in it. And so I have some markets where we have loan officers and I might have 15 loan officers and none of them have ever utilized the SPCP program. So now you're starting to ask the question as to whether or not they're going out into those communities. Um, we look at usage based on digital versus field sales. 
um, and how is that looking? So from a digital perspective, you have customers that are coming in um, and you know uh, the field sales folks are only marketing based on the customer's conversation and what they need and, and how is that um, faring. So we'll look at those types of things. Um, I know no one has asked this question, but I would say this. Um, the fact that we don't do it based on the race of the customer. We look at the geography. That's a big thing uh, because what we're starting to see now with this digital experience, you know, you have a lot of folks, a lot of black and Hispanic folks that are still wanting to be anonymous. And so therefore I can't ensure that they receive it if they're not putting that information on the application. And so again, another uh, opportunity for us to encourage um, and, and de demystify the home ownership process so that folks know it's important that they complete the government monitoring information um, when they put it out there because we probably are seeing more customers receive it or a larger percentage, but because they're not putting the government monitoring information on there, I don't know. And so the best thing that I can do is look at it by way of track in, or by way of geography. Um, so again, looking at all of those different factors and not only do we look at those factors, but those are that's information that I talk about on a, like let's say on a monthly basis. I will bring up my entire sales organization all the way up to the CEO of Home Lending, and then that way giving them an opportunity to take a look at how we're performing so that we can make some sound decisions across the board. So it's very intensive because this is an 18-month window. I don't know if anybody. Uh, so when you leverage SPCP, you have 18 months. And within that 18 months, you have to talk about the progress that you made. Has anything changed? Um, and if nothing has changed, then you got to re-up your re written plan with insights and data points that say that this, this group or this segment is still being underserved, and therefore we're going to continue our program. And so that, that, that's the reason I have to do all of the monitoring, just to make sure that we're doing it within the confines of the ACOA um, documentation and Reg B, but then also um, in, um, consistent with our written plan and what we've written. So a lot of, it's a lot, it's a lot of work. And I, and I will share that with everyone because if you don't build those processes up front, it's gonna be very difficult for you to maintain your program and make sure that your program is doing what it was intended to do. Thank you, Sarita. And Ken, do you wanna give us any kind of final thoughts, uh, maybe encouragement on SPCPs? No, well, I mean, there's significant focus on SPCPs now. A lot of folks are doing it. Sarita described their experience. I think, you know, it's a tool that's out there that the law provides. I would encourage everybody to do it. It's not as difficult as it sounds to implement. I've worked with a number of significant lenders to put them in place. Um, and if you're thoughtful about it and you work through the issues, I think it can be a benefit both for the institution and for the communities that we're all looking to serve. Absolutely. Thank you. So and, and I just oh, yeah. wanted to sell just the tool that you guys have that you did sure. with the MBA. I'm telling you, it's probably one of the best tools out there. And I know I don't, it's on your website or whatever, yep. but make sure you sell that because I think people will get your a lot of great in the information. Mail, Sarita. <laughs> so it is, it is free. It is free. So that, that's probably one of the big benefits too. And um, folks uh, on the NAFA team and the MBA team and others put a lot of effort into it. And now it's available to all of you. So it's uh, spcptoolkit.com. Uh, a lot of resources, all the resources that, um, that uh, Frank and Pam mentioned. Um, so uh, let's give a round of applause to our last speaker. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>